Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 20th, 2023. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeppler, also known as Jeff Epler, and Adafruit sponsors me to work on CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and folks like me, uh, consider your purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join us anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. There's pretty much 24-7 activity, but we hold this meeting in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython Voice channel, uh, typically on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it co coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there is a link to the calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications or if you'd like to participate in the meeting, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. I just mentioned the notes document. Um, if you are participating live, you'll find that under the pinned messages tab. Otherwise, you'll find a link in the doobly-doo with uh, timestamps so that you can skip around to the parts that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, and after the meeting, we will pin the next week's meeting notes to the CircuitPython Dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can find that uh, document anytime during the week uh, so that you can add your notes, your hug reports, and your status updates for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, uh, a look at all things Python, CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community, and it's a preview of our Python and microcontrollers newsletter made by the inimitable um, Anne. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blanca. It is a quantitative overview of the whole project and a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. Next, and the first participatory section is Hug Reports, an opportunity to highlight the good folks things are doing taking the time to recognize awesome folks uh, in and around the community. And that's fun, I just got signed out of the document that I was in. Bear with me here as I get back in. All right, that's fun. All right, so where were we? Hug reports, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The next up after that is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week or so. And if you have anything else uh, from your life that's appropriate to share, please do. Uh, we like to get to know each other a little better than just talking about the work. And then the fifth and optional part is in the weeds, the opportunity for a more long form discussion. This discussion can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. And with that, I will uh, step over to community news. Uh, first up, MicroPython support for the Raspberry Pi Pico W has started. Um, oh, okay. For the Pico W, Bluetooth has supported. So Phil Howard at Pimeroni is working to complete a GitHub pull request for Bluetooth support in MicroPython. It's labeled as experimental at the moment. The notes say Bluetooth works. You'll want Adafruit's Bluefruit Connect and the MicroPython BLE simple peripheral.py and BLE advertising.py if you want to experimentally kick the tires. And uh, thanks, Tim, for getting some of the links. There is a Twitter and a GitHub, um, as well as a blog discussing the progress. Up uh, as item number two, CircuitPython 8.0.4 has been released. It is a bug fix revision of CircuitPython and the newest stable release. And we've got a link to the blog and the GitHub release notes. We encourage everybody who is using uh, CircuitPython uh, to upgrade to this latest bug fix version. Another MicroPython item, MicroPython switches to a new package manager known as MIP. MIP stands for MIP installs packages and it's similar in context in concept to Python's pip tool, but it does not use the PyPI index, rather it uses MicroPython lib. It will automatically fetch compiled MPY files when downloading from MicroPython lib, and there is a link to the documentation in MicroPython. 
Next up, we have podcasts. Circuit Pythonista Charlin Gonda was interviewed on Embedded.fm. They spoke with uh, her about making things glow, dealing with imposter syndrome, and using origami. Um, the projects talked about are documented on her website. You can find her on Instagram and Mastodon. Adafruit came up a lot in this episode. And uh, those are just a few items from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter. Uh, this and more is available in our weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out via email on Tuesday mornings. To subscribe, visit adafruitdaily.com. And a big thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any pri Python on project hard, if you have any Python on hardware projects to share, whether that is Circuit Python, MicroPython, uh, or Python running on a Raspberry Pi or single board computer, please consider contributing that to the newsletter. You can open a pull request on GitHub, tag at an engineer on Twitter with the hashtag CircuitPython, or email cpnews at Adafruit dot com with a link and that is community news next we are going to talk about the state of circuit python the libraries and blinka um, so this is a quantitative overview of the whole project it's mostly stats plucked from github and a few other places it gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates we'll talk about the project overall then separately discuss the core libraries and blinka and uh, Scott, Katney, Melissa, if uh, there's any reason that I can't pass it over to you at the appropriate time, please let me know. All right. So overall, on the past seven days, we uh, saw 27 pull requests merged from 19 authors. And regrettably, I didn't go through this list to uh, mention people who I don't uh, see as regular contributors. So I'll just read a couple of off. Uh, we've got Brent Y.I., uh, Paint Your Dragon is a native fruit person, but doesn't uh, work on CircuitPython a whole lot, so thank you. Cryer, Cree Steve, Steve Steam Foundry, uh, there's a lot of less familiar names here. C. Karchner, B.W. Shockley, Furbrain, so thanks to those uh, folks who are less frequent contributors, and thanks to the folks who are regular contributors as well. And next stat, we had eight reviewers across everything. So big thanks, especially to those who are not uh, kind of the core people. So uh, thank you, MicroDev, uh, and thank you to Jose Posada, as well as more internal people like Tim, myself, uh, Scott, Dan, Melissa, and Tectric. Issues-wise, we saw 26 issues closed by 14 people and 17 open by 16 people. So it's uh, nice to see a downward trend for a week, and it's nice to see the number of people who are uh, participating in issues. So thank you to all of those folks. And now I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Hello. Okay, for the core, we had 13 pull requests merged from 10 different authors. So thank you to all of those authors. Uh, we had five reviewers, uh, and thanks again to reviewers. We're always looking for more reviewers because the more reviewers we have, Oh, good morning. Um, <laughs> uh, the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Um, we have 35 open pull requests, which is quite a lot, but many, many of those are drafts. So if you have uh, boards in particular that have open draft PRs, please take a look at those. Um, and a number of these are, are pretty early, so that's good too. Um, Issues-wise, we had 17 closed issues by 8 people and 13 opened by 12 people. So a good number of people involved and getting through issues, which is awesome. We have a total of 639 open issues. Uh, we use milestones to gauge priority for Adafruit-funded folks. Um, so we have zero open issues on 8.0.x, uh, which is our kind of highest priority thing. And then the next stable release will be 8.1, and there's 11 open issues on 8.1. Um, we have uh, 25 for 9.0, and uh, 9.0 will probably, development will probably start after 8.1 is marked stable. Um, we have seven issues not assigned to milestones, so we'll have to take a look at those and prioritize those, tri triage and prioritize those as well. And that's uh, the numbers for the core. Thank you, Scott. Next mm -hmm. up is the libraries, and uh, Katni, may I say welcome back. Thank you. So 
Uh, this is about all of the uh, CircuitPython libraries, including the CircuitPython community bundle, the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and a few extras, such as our cookie cutter. Uh, we had 12 pull requests merged across all of those libraries uh, with eight authors and four reviewers, uh, leaving us with 42 open pull requests. We had seven closed issues by five people and four opened by four people, leaving us with 602 open issues. 74 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, uh, including a list of open pull requests and all of the issues listed out as well by library. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the open issues page. Um, if you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Um, if uh, We have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Uh, take a look at the code. If you have the hardware, please test it. If you do not, check the code, make sure everything seems solid. Leave a comment and let us know you did that. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. In terms of Library PyPI weekly download stats, there were 167,769 PyPI downloads over 309 libraries, and the top 10 can be found in the notes. Um, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, five. new libraries. Yeah, um, and a number of updated libraries. One thing I do want to call out is that uh, Cedar Grove Studios submitted CircuitPython underscore AD5293. That is the 100th community library to be submitted to the community bundle. So congratulations, C. Grover. Thank you so much. And congratulations to everybody who submitted to the bundle to get us to this number. Um, we always had high hopes for the community bundle. And obviously, uh, without community support, um, and us supporting the community, it, you know, wouldn't uh, live up to what we hoped it would, but it has definitely become that and it is continuing to be that. Um, so thank you to everyone who has submitted a community library. And that's what we have for the libraries. All right, thank you, Katni. And to round out this section, Melissa will give us the updates on Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and one reviewer. Uh, there are currently four open pull requests amongst all the repositories. And there were two closed issues by one person and <clears throat> zero open, uh, leaving a net of 94 open issues. Uh, we had 16,449 PyPI downloads in the last week and 10,489 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are at 101 uh, boards. Um, so it's all looking good. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, the next section is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, then go down the list in the document order to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I have a hug report to Tim, foamy guy. It was nice to see you in person and thank you for picking up the tab. We had a lovely brunch together, got to catch up on mostly non CircuitPython stuff. Um, that was fun. Next up, Dan, thank you for taking over that pull request to enable creating FAT32 file systems again. I had uh, made a change between 7.3 and 8 to disable the creation of larger FAT file systems uh, across all of the boards to save flash storage. And a user ran into this as a problem because they wanted to format a larger SD card with CircuitPython. And I made a quick pull request to re-enable that, but it didn't quite fit on all of the boards. Um, and Dan took that over, so thank you. And final hug to Katni. Welcome back. The community missed you, and I missed you. And next, I'll read notes from C. Grover, and after that, hand it over to Dan. C. Grover writes, a hug to Blitz City DIY, Liz, for the beautiful, plucky, and sweet-sounding MIDI liar robot. A second hug to Jose David for the quick turnaround of a community bundle submission. 
And finally, a hug to the 27 plus contributors to the CircuitPython bus device library. Was having some interference and performance issues using two spy devices from the same manufacturer. Bus device was able to sort it out and accommodate the disparate lock and timing constraints. This is an utterly amazing tool that just works. And next up is Dan. Okay, uh, thanks to you, Jeff, for uh, knowing why uh, formatting larger SD cards did not work. So you remembered what you've done and that saved me work in trying to pursue that. That was great. And thanks to Scott for pursuing performance and kind of turning it into a uh, science rather than a, uh, an ad hoc thing. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next, I have notes from David Glode, and then I'll hand it over to, I guess I'll be reading more notes from a couple of people. All right. So first, uh, David writes, a hug to DJ Devon 3 for the first and only international shipping of a TR Cowbell. To Naradoc for adding board.display support on the Lowland S2 Pico. And to TT Moby for adding LilyGo T embed support. And to Mayor Melissa for updating that on circuitpython.org. And as DJ Devon 3 doesn't seem to be here, I'll read his notes as well. Uh, Devon has a hug to Tectric for volunteering to review my Steam API example PR for the Adafruit request library. A hug to all the community members that turned out for last week's show and tell, with a special hug to Steve X for his first show and tell. He showed a really nice solderless multi solenoid and relay project. And finally, a hug to Skur for advice on a PCB design project. All right, Fomi guy, you are up, and then I'll read notes from uh, Jose David. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, first up, hug report uh, for you. Uh, it was great to get a chance to hang out and catch up over a meal. I uh, definitely appreciate it and had a great time. Um, thanks to Isaac Ben, uh, Neerdoc, and Anecdata, as well as Scott, uh, all of whom helped me in various different ways to be able to get the disk info uh, web workflow API working. I could not have got there without help from all of these folks. Uh, and a hug report for Jose David, who's responded to a couple of different issues across GitHub and has been submitting lots of different uh, improvements across lots of different libraries as well. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, by the way, Foamy Guy lives just a couple hours away, so like this is the second time I've hung out with him, but uh, you know, it takes a bit of an excuse to drive three hours. Anyway, uh, Jose David writes a hug to Naradoc for being helpful. And to test the simple dial library in the LilyGo watch to make a clock. I only wear a watch while exercising, but I've ordered a LilyGo watch to use with CircuitPython. Thanks to Naradoc for adding the support for it. Next, a hug to C. Grover for including the 805293 digital potentiometer driver in the community bundle. A hug for Furbrain, also for including two new community libraries, Async Button and it says here Distox library. I'm not sure what library that is. Uh, also a hug for DJ Devon 3 for helping me with hardware ideas and being an excellent sounding board for new projects. Next a hug for Tectric for solving an old issue in the community library zip packaging system. Zip files in the release artifacts were only including the examples files when the library was a package. And thanks also to Casa Ino for reporting it. And finally uh, a hug to Foamy Guy for testing and finding the problem with the Blink a Heart example in bitmap font. And that brings us to hug reports from Katni. Uh, so first up, uh, to reiterate, a hug report for C. Grover for submitting the 100th library to the community bundle. I have a hug report for Keith the EE for a wonderful Circuit Python LED hat workshop and build along on the Python Discord. It's been over a year in the coming and uh, it was absolutely wonderful and worth it. Um, and I hope that uh, there are more to come in the future. And finally, a group hug to the whole community for keeping everything running smoothly while I was out for three weeks. This is the first time I've completely disconnected from work for a vacation, and knowing this community is amazing was a part of why I was willing to do that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Katni. Uh, next, we have maker Melissa. Um, I wanted to give a hug to Dan for helping out with circuitpython.org, and... Um, also to David Glode for contributing to CircuitPython.org. I want to give a hug to uh, Matthew JS and L. I'm sure I butchered that uh, for fixing the Rock Four and Orange Pi Four boards in Blinka. And Katni, uh, welcome back. Uh, I want to give a hug to 
everyone who has tried the new installer and provided feedback and group hug to everyone else. Thank you, Melissa. I will read notes from a couple of folks and then let Scott wrap up this section. Uh, but first, Mark writes uh, a hug to Tanut for some quick answers about how he was doing performance testing to give me a path to follow, as well as some PR review suggestions. Then I have a note from Paul Cutler, uh, a hug for Deshapu and Nerdoc for helping me with code for my reverse TFT remote control project this weekend. And now, take it away, Scott. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, first, a hug to Foamy Guy for the Disk Info API PR. Totally did not expect it. Haven't looked at it yet, but I saw it go by in the chat, and I'm very excited, so thanks for picking that up. Um, a hug report to Werewolf um, from IM Hex. It's a uh, kind of reverse engineering hex viewer tool um, that I definitely recommend. Um, the coolest part about it is that you can have bookmarks. So if you're trying to understand a binary file, um, you can either generate a bookmarks file that has JSON in it and load it and visualize it in IMX, IM hex, or you could just annotate it um, by drawing on it and then export it, which is cool as well. So uh, they helped me uh, understand what the format was and uh, on their Discord, so that was super helpful. Um, a hug report to Flavio um, T on GitHub for the PySigRock PRs. Um, they had dropped into the SIGROC IRC channel and asking about a plug plugin based version of SIGROC. And I was like, oh, I know this. So I, I managed to contact them and, and they were super excited and did some PR. So I'm going to look at those this week. And then lastly, Gordon from Raspberry Pi um, just dropped me an email to, to let me know that they're now automating their USB PID listings. Um, those of you have probably seen that there's been uh, some PRs blocked by the people saying they got a PID from Raspberry Pi, but it wasn't listed publicly. So Gordon's updated uh, his workflow so that um, they get updated more quickly, which is super helpful and uh, wanted to do a hug report for that. And that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next up is status updates. It's the time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and then we'll go through the list in the document order. When I call on you, please take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and, you what, and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity to provide quick tips and tricks, but if this discussion becomes long, it's best to move it into In the Weeds. And just another gentle reminder, you can add your topics to In the Weeds at any time until we get there. And I will go first. Um, I've been working for a couple of weeks on audio output on the IMX, specifically using the I2S out peripheral. And uh, finally, I got this morning the bit clock and the LR clock pins toggling. Uh, there's no actual audio data coming out yet. Hopefully once the audio data comes out, it will be close to done. I'm guessing it's a pin muxing problem because that and clocking have been the two problems that I've had, uh, but I don't know yet. And um, next up, there is also a peripheral called the Medium Quality Audio. It's a way that the chip internally can take one of the I2S out uh, peripheral data and turn it into a PWM audio stream on a particular pair of pins. Uh, so they would really share most of the implementation. That is what I will be working on next after I2S out is wrapped up. Um, yeah, so that's what is up with me. It feels like a short list but there's just been a lot of uh, learning, self-teaching about how the IMX works um, all along with this. And next, because uh, Ketney needs to leave early, um, why don't you go ahead with your status update? Thank you. Um, it's looking like we might be done by the time I have to go, but still, I didn't want to take a chance. All right, that's so, fine. La yeah. Last week, I uh, returned from being out for a bit and uh, worked on Thursday and Friday, which was basically just filled with uh, miscellaneous tasks, um, which of which I have many. Uh, so it was good to kind of get through some of that uh, backlog. This week, I will be writing up the guide for the Feather RP20 or R RP2040 DVI board. Um, it's pretty much identical on, on some level to the RP2040. However, there are eight pins used um, for a DVI output on the board. 
So uh, the I'll be doing up a guide for that. Um, the next one up is the Feather RP2040 RFM boards, uh, plural. There are four, I believe, um, but they all use the exact same uh, pinouts. So I'll be doing the board definition for those and the pretty pins um, to get ahead of that. Um, and then, depending on how long those take, uh, I'll begin documenting um, grow light and time lapse projects between feather things. Um, other stuff, I paused the time lapse. I think that particular plant is slowly dying. If it was going to bloom, it would have already. This means I can set it up in a better location and in a better way when I choose another plant to, to photograph. Also, use a Raspberry Pi that's more available, currently using a Pi 02W, and pick another less dying plant to time lapse. Um, I built a grow light setup for my air plants right before leaving four weeks ago. I researched it and apparently dot stars have the right frequencies for plant growth. The plants are thriving, so evidently it's working. They require a lot of light to be happy. Incidentally, I had the brightness set at 20% from testing, which I completely forgot about. Uh, so I bumped it up to 70 yesterday and apparently overdid it. Came in this morning to dim LEDs, a powered off microcontroller and electrical burning smell. The board was fine, dropped brightness to 50, plugged it all back in, same results, swapped out the power supply and everything is happy. Again, uh, that power supply is now in the trash. Um, there will be a guide for this project, but I'll be using far less LEDs. I already knew this was overkill, but apparently it's serious overkill. For the linear space that I'm lighting, I apparently need 60 LEDs, and there are currently 384. Um, I use the high density dot star strips when medium density or even low density would likely work. So for the actual guide, I'll be using uh, a much lower density um, strip, which also is much easier to solder. And, um, will probably be able to be at full brightness without destroying another power supply. That's what I've got. Live and learn. <laughs> Pretty much. And uh, before we move on, I'll just uh, circle back. I was uh, talking about the DistoX library and Foamy Guy says, uh, it mimics the DistoX protocol for communicating with paperless cave surveying tools and apparently it works over Bluetooth. So uh, if you're in that world, you probably know what it is. And if you're not in that world, you probably don't need it. But uh, anyhow, next I have notes from C. Grover, who is text only. Uh, C. Grover writes, the final evolution of the string length calculator algorithm for the string car feather wing project was completed and successfully tested on the bench. This is a sensorless version that uses the initial string end collision of the first lap to learn string length and predict, predict the return trip regardless of DC motor speed and battery decay. It looks like the weather may prevent an infield test between trees along the river very soon. After reaching a few false summits, the AD5293 digital potentiometer driver was completed and submitted to the community bundle. This is a 10-bit linear potentiometer that accommodates true AC signals by using the dual power supplies needed by op amps. It's the final piece of the technical puzzle for the Precision VCO module project. Osh Park produced the extra perfect custom breakout PCB. And next, with appropriate musical fanfare, is the Precision VCO Eurorack module. And next up, we have news from Dan. Okay, so uh, last Tuesday I released CircuitPython 804. Um, right now, I don't have any urgent fixes in the pipeline for an 805, so uh, maybe it'll stay that way. We'll see. Um, I fixed a bunch of miscellaneous build and release problems. I fixed an HID library issue that somebody found in which the LED, the keyboard LED state was not being remembered properly. So that um, PR is still actually uh, waiting to be reviewed. Maybe I'll have the original post to review it, or if somebody else wants to review it, that'd be great. Um, I also noticed that there are a bunch of sort of outstanding issues for the HID library. And um, another thing I noticed is that uh, we don't, our examples for HID code don't check to see whether a, a, the um, USB is connected or not, which that didn't exist when the uh, HID library was written. So it's probably worth updating the examples in the library and some of the, at least some of the examples in uh, the learn guide. So I'll probably take a look at that on and off. Uh, there were a lot of things to review, and there were a lot of bugs to test, potential bugs to test to see if they were really bugs or not. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. So I, I feel like I'm 
fighting a lot of fires at the moment, but they're small fires. So uh, when I get off of that, I'll try to go back to working on more uh, 8xx issues and especially things like USB host for IMX or other things for IMX. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Dan. And now that you mentioned that, I know that one of my projects on Learn was affected by this not checking USB connected, and I guess I'll go ahead, go back and fix that now. Uh, anyway, next I've got notes from a couple of people, and up after that will be Foamy Guy. Uh, so David Glode writes uh, that he's been testing the board.display support for the Lolin S2 Pico by Naradoc, uh, closing the issue, updating circuitpython.org, as well as quick testing of the LilyGo T embed by TT Moby. Next, DJ Devon writes, uh, submitted a PR for a 3D design of the Adafruit 7-inch TFT touchscreen to the Adafruit CAD parts repo. Should make it easier for anyone wanting to print a 3D enclosure using the bare 7-inch display. The 5-inch display is still missing from CAD parts, however, anyone can now scale down the 7-inch to 5-inch since they're almost identical except for display size. Next up, my LoRa male boombox is now a 2 times 40 watt system for 100 watts peak. For a 4 inch speaker system, that's pretty impressive. Switched to a 100 watt pile amplifier with built in Bluetooth Classic. It'll help cut down on the spaghetti monster inside the mailbox. And finally, designed a mountable 50 NeoPixel strip on a PCB that I'm calling Bleeding Rainbow. Adafruit's NeoPixel strip would have worked nicely, but I wanted to learn how to design a NeoPixel strip myself for the next version of the TR Cowbell. All right, Tim, you are up next. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, last like a uh, couple of weeks or so, I've been fighting against my computer a little bit with some issues that I was thinking were hardware issues, and I swapped out some RAM and have updated lots of things and have seen some improvements, but have also seen some, some weirdness that <clears throat> is cropping up during CircuitPython builds. Um, but I'm um, kind of going fingers crossed and um, hoping that we can at least be done with uh, it freezing up, which I haven't seen since the last couple of rounds of things I've updated. So uh, improvement, but still something going on in there that I'm trying to get worked out. Um, I, in CircuitPython land, I um, tested out some of the speed um, differences between the boundary fill uh, function, which there's an open PR to add some handling of background tasks and interrupts to that. So uh, put in an example and some results on that PR with uh, the differences in times for those two uh, variations. Um, last week I worked on uh, a, a change in the scrolling label um, library, or it's actually just in the display text library, but it's the, the scrolling label specifically had a slightly different API with regards to the name of the property that you can use to set its text, uh, which was due to me not knowing uh, a different way to do it when I wrote it initially, uh, but I have since learned that and went back um, and fixed that based on uh, some feedback on an issue there. Um, I implemented the disk info endpoint for uh, web workflow. Uh, learned a lot about FATFS, uh, which I think is, I guess, the library we use for handling that stuff, as well as just the core uh, generally in the process. Um, for this week, I have a couple of different PRs lined up uh, most of them are around uh, web stuff, um, in particular Ethernet. I got to get out my Featherwing and my uh, other router and get stuff set back up on my desk to test with that this week. So um, that's what I've got going on. Thanks. All right. I'll read some notes from Jose David, and then after that is Maker Melissa. So Jose David has been working on pull request reviews, as well as an issue for the EMC2101, which I believe is a library, and I don't know what the device does. All right, Melissa, you are up next. Um, so last week I finished up uh, the changes to the CircuitPython installer. So it can be used in um, other places besides CircuitPython.org. Um, I made a small follow-up PR on CircuitPython.org that fixes some bugs um, with the installer and updates one of the boards. I worked more on a secret chat GPT project, which I'm hoping to share on show and tell this week. I updated the web serial ESP tool code uh, to remove some deprecated stuff. Uh, this week I'm going to work on um, designing a 3D printable printable part for the secret project and then um, finish that all up and I'll likely start writing a guide for it and then I'll work on fixing some other GitHub stuff after that. And that's where I'm at. 
All right, I think I've heard the rumor about what the project is, and if what I heard is right, it will be worth tuning in to uh, Show and Tell to see this project when it is ready. Uh, sounds fun. Anyway, and uh, last reminder, if you have any In the Weeds topics, add them now. But uh, now I will read notes from Mark, a.k.a. Gambler, who is hopefully finishing up a pull request to ensure memory release for on-disk GIF and display audio bitmap that are quicker and easier to pick up by the garbage collector. And now, Scott, you get to round out this section of status updates. All right. So <laughs> you know the preview of this, but I spent a lot of time last week trying to figure out how some mystery build um, of CircuitPython was seemingly twice as fast. And I ended up getting to the point where I, <laughs> I could generate builds that were the same. And one of the things that I had to change was the way that I was measuring the time, um, which is not, which was not right. Um, so by changing how I measured time, I changed what the results were, even though it wasn't actually faster, um, which is a huge face palm. And I knew it, I had done that and yeah, it, it's frustrating uh, for sure. Um, I learned a lot of neat, reverse engineering sorts of tools and processes um, to figure that out. Um, lots of squinting at hex dumps, um, which I did get pretty much identical results, which is kind of cool. Um, but the moral of the story is that you should always have a reference, uh, reference measurement, clock measurement, to make sure that your, your uh, onboard clock is, is in the right ballpark. So I'm working on adding that right now, and then I will uh, publish the, I think that it's already as a draft PR, but I, I had to fix the Teensy 4, which I just did. Um, and so I'll polish that up and hopefully get that out today. Um, once that PR is out, I think, I haven't run the numbers because the script's not working, but I think it is like a 3x speed up, so it should be awesome. Um, once the PR is out, I'm going to do some e-paper tests. I've got a prototype of the e-paper feather. Um, and Lamar also asked me to do a, a check on the RP2040's deep sleep power consumption. So I'll be taking a look, a quick look at that um, while I'm doing e-paper stuff. After that, I'm going to get back to the IMX and try to get all of the EVKs going um, because uh, unlike the SAMD 51 or 21, we're actually starting at the bottom of the chip family line, which is quite exciting because we're going to have faster and more RAM uh, chips kind of that we can can move to or, or make products for afterwards. So uh, I want to make sure that uh, that we're ready for that. And I should say that the EVKs are the are the the manufacturers dev kits evaluation kits. Um, from NXP for the IMX. So I've got a collection of those. I've been so excited for these for so long. So uh, I'm excited to get to that and uh, support the full family. Maybe even including the 1176, which has a, it's clocked at a gigahertz, which is kind of obscene. <laughs> All right. Thank I'm you, look at that. Scott. Kind of excited about it, honestly. Yeah, sounds like. Um, so <laughs> we have no In the Weeds topics this week. So I will do the little outro. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for March 30th, 2023. Thanks to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing your parts from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Video of this meeting is released on YouTube at youtube.com adafruit. And the podcast is also available on major podcast services. It is also featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held at the usual time of 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Monday, March 27th. Just a reminder, we are already observing daylight saving time or summertime here in the United States. Uh, I think various other countries are switching over now or soon, so just double check what that offset is to your local time. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it discord. 
To be notified about this meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. It's free, it gets you just a few notifications a week, and we'd love to uh, add people and bring you into our community a little closer. Anyway, that's all. We hope to see you next week. Thank you, everybody.